911, Operator Frost, where's your emergency? Oh, hi, I'm at 333 East Main Street. We have an active shooter. And how do you know you have an active shooter on the site? I just watched it. How do you watch? Watched you watch it on a team's on a team's meeting? He's an employee of Old National Bank. Get here now. Keeping an eye on Spaghetti Junction, and yep, traffic really starting to pick up as more and more of us are getting out on the roads, and of course, those kids getting back to school, so I'm sure a lot of those alarms are going off right now. It's a normal day, you know, got up, got ready, dropped the little one off at school, and headed to work. It's Monday morning, you know, after Easter, you know, kind of, uh, didn't need some coffee to get me going. It's Monday morning, my wife is never at home. She was home that morning. So we're having this conversation. I said, oh, I got to get downtown. I said, hopefully there's no traffic on the expressway. And everything went smooth down 64. I just remember getting ready to get out, looking and seeing my scarf. I usually wear scarves. I remember having a vivid conversation in my head about the scarf. And like, I'm like it's not really that cold. I don't need it. It was a big winter scarf, you know, like, but at the last minute I threw it around my neck and headed on into work. I wasn't even supposed to be here. My shift doesn't start till 10 a.m., um, but I had put in for overtime that day. But it was just a regular, regular day, regular Monday. It was kind of quiet. I had been working the weekend prior, and so um, I wasn't here super early on Monday morning. In fact, I think I drove through that intersection between the bank and the baseball stadium about 15 or 20 minutes before all of this went down. And then that first call comes in and then the phones start going crazy. 911, Operator Davis, what is the address of the emergency? Oh my God, there's an active shooter there. But, um, oh my God, uh, what, oh my God, I just walked on it. Oh, on a pier. my favorite thing about him. He had a heart-shaped face, and when he smiled, his whole face just lit up. He had these big, bright eyes. He was just always in the thick of things with the kids, and that's where he was happiest. Good job! In the summer, he was always in the pool throwing them around, and if the kids were happy, he was happy. If we were just simple, if we were happy, it was good. I'm the second of four boys. Josh was the, the fourth. So I was in third grade when he was born. The day he got to come home from the hospital, <laughs> um, I pretended to be sick so that I could be home when he got home. But growing up, Josh was always known as Baby Josh. Um, and still is. <laughs> whenever we would start picking on him, um, he would always run to mom, and he knew that mom would jump right in and defend him, and we'd be in trouble if, you know, if we laid a finger on him. Uh, and he, yeah, that nickname stuck. He was my buddy. We met at a bar. It was July 4th weekend. Kind of hung out my group of friends with his group of friends, and from that point on, we kind of did the long distance thing, and then we were engaged by December. <laughs> Said he had met this girl at a bar. I was like, at a bachelor party, that's perfect. <laughs> but then we met Jessica, and, and she was perfect. Goofy, mm -hmm. immature. That's kind of what, when we first met, I just remember like laughing. He's so funny. He was hilarious. <laughs> Everything about him just clicked. We got married October 27th of 2012. And then our daughter came December of 2013. And then my son was about two years after my daughter. He was at work and I called him. I was like, you're gonna be a daddy. And he was like, no way, no way. He came home from work early that day. He was so excited. Like he, he, all he wanted to do was be a dad. He was phenomenal.
the hole that he leaves is massive. He was a centerpiece. And it's just a huge, huge void that he's gone. Walked in like normal, walked past the conference room where everybody usually has their meeting in the morning and headed to my desk where I ran in to Connor. And I remember seeing somebody go into an office, didn't think much about it. He came out of the office, we spoke. He had safety glasses on and a gun in his hand. I'm Dallas Schwartz and I work at Old National Bank. I've worked at a bank since I was 17, right out of high school. My last job I worked at for 24 years, then moved to Old National Bank. My dad was like, I don't even know what you do, but it's working with business clients, products that they would need to make their business more efficient. Things like ACH for payroll, online banking type things. So you help people get paid? Yes. It's very important. I've lived in Southern Indiana my whole life. I have a seven-year-old. I also have two stepkids that are 16. I raised them since they were three. I got shot in the leg. I went to the ground, still just being confused. And it wasn't until I had heard other shots that I finally got up and ran the other way. That scarf that I debated on bringing in that morning. I don't know what made me think to do it, but I tied it around my leg. Once I got in the bathroom and realized how bad, because I think I still really didn't realize that I was shot with a real gun. Scary, it was scary. I didn't know what was happening. The gunshots were scary, but the silent parts were even scarier. Not knowing where he was at in the building, not knowing if it was coming back. You know, I, I was somewhere where I wasn't locked in. The door, the lock on the door did not work. There was nothing in that room to barricade the door, so he could have came back at any minute. In, in that bathroom, you know, I walked back and forth. You know, I, I just paced, I didn't know what to do. I'd move from one stall to the next till I finally just went in, back into the big stall and sat down. And I called 911 and they did not answer. And as it rang and rang and rang, you know, more things came into my head. You know, oh my gosh, what if I go into shock? What if I don't even get this message across to them? When I finally couldn't get a hold of them, I just hung up and began to text my husband and my mom to call 911. And so I continued to text with them, like throughout the time I was in the bathroom hiding. I know that the first call, a woman who was on a video conference with some people at the bank, I think that she heard the shots. I think that she saw some people either either fall, having been shot, or hiding. You're the only person calling this into us, okay? So 333 East Main Street, what's the name of the business we're going to? It's Old National Bank. Okay, that's the business we're going to also? And how do you know you have an active shooter on the site? I just watched it. How do you watch watched you it, watched it on, on meeting? On the team's meeting? Yes, we were having a board meeting. Video board meeting? The caller explained what she saw on that video conference, we knew that it was gonna be bad. Um, but I don't think that we really expected how bad it was. Let me get the run sent up. Can you just stay on the line with me, okay? One moment here. Okay, this video's still going. Oh my God, there's no, I can't see anything now. It's up to the ground. We had reports that indicated it could really be a a really huge event. 
I could see this run come up and I knew I had to get that run dispatched as soon as possible. Dispatcher said, can you go to the service channel? I need to put this out. That piqued my curiosity because that rarely happens. And her voice, I'd never heard that before. We have shots fired, 333 East Main at the old National Bank. We've all heard uh, active shooter before and okay, you know, what, what is getting ready to happen? And they turn out to be what they call swatting calls or just bogus calls. Nothing really clicked to me until the dispatcher says, I have another phone call from inside the bank and there are four people down. So I'm gone. And the phones started lighting up. The, the board was turning red. Um, multiple people were calling in. There are only so many call takers on shift at a time. It became obvious there was something to this. This was not going to be a false call. And I actually stood up and I asked my supervisors to send me some help. And one of my coworkers, Emily David, came over to help me. I was just sitting down, putting my headset back on whenever the run popped up. And um, I could hear, you know, sort of rumblings around the room. Oh, an uh, active aggressor. And, and my partner on the fire desk, I could hear him start to knock out the units. 315 from Metro. 120 Metro. 102 Metro. 15 on Metro. It was just absolute chaos on the air. You could, you had all of the responders coming and, you know, there were lights flashing in the room and, you know, people yelling back and forth and the phones were ringing. That sense of panic almost and, and uh, but you have to turn that into, what can I do to help? Normal one, Operator Frost, where's your emergency? Hi, I'm at 333 East Main Street. We are an active shooter. When she first called, she said that there was an active shooter inside the building, that she was hiding in a closet. There were people shot. She didn't um, know what kind of injuries they had, but there was blood everywhere. Has anybody been shot? Yes. I will never forget her. I will never forget her voice the way she sounded, the way she whispered. I'll never forget it. Yes, but I'm in a closet hiding. I played back in my head things that she was saying. I was focused on making sure I was asking the questions that I needed to ask, focused on her, making sure she stayed quiet, but also trying to get information from her, trying to listen to the background so that I knew when to ask the questions. Because of course, if you're here in gunfire, you don't want to ask somebody a question to have them answer you, to put them in harm's way. 113 Baker, it was one of the downtown units. They were the first ones that communicated that they were on scene. Uh, that was Officer Wiltz um, and his training officer, Officer Galloway. Baker, we're making entry from the uh, from the east side at Preston and Main. We're actually walking up to the left side of the bank. We hear gunfire and officer down. I heard a shot, and that's when I realized it was real. It's not only an active shooter, it's a rescue mission as well. And I said to Detective Shaw, get in your car, Montana, open up the door on the passenger side. We're gonna do an officer rescue. So we used my vehicle, uh, Officer Jay Moss was in the back seat, and we had two other officers using the car shoes. 
We were gonna try to go get him, put him in that car and go to the hospital. I was hanging on kind of as a semi-barricade maybe. Gunshots ring out again. God damn it! I have no idea where the shooter's at. I can't see inside that first floor, the mirrored glass. Uh, that turned out to be the lobby area where the shooter had taken up a tactical position. He had positioned himself to have cover with the elevator shaft kind of tucked back out of our line of sight. The shooter has an angle on that officer. We need to get up there. I don't know where he's at. The glass is blocking him. It was a nightmare. He was doing everything he could to keep us from being able to get to our officer. He's shooting straight through these windows right towards the officer. We need to be able to plate somehow to be able to get there and pull him down from the stairs. I went from pillar to post, uh, one concrete barrier to the next. I seen uh, Officer Wilt laying down, uh, Officer Smallwood in the street. I said, cover me, and I just shot up the steps, grabbed his hand, rolled him over, saw that he was gravely injured, and um, I just told him, oh, we're getting out of here. And as I'm trying to get my hands in his vest, I um, can't really do it because of the blood. Just as I'm trying to tug on him, shots ring out above my head, by my ear. God, don't have an angle. So I kind of retreat back down to the concrete pillar. I look over at Officer Smallwood and I said to him, uh, put your gun up, I need help. I see Officer Galloway fire a couple shots. As we get to the top of the steps, I hear Officer Galloway say, I think I got him down, I think he's down. Yank the left door off now! Yank him down the stairs! I think the shooter gave us an out. When he shot at us, the other officer was able to get a shot on him. Move it. Yeah. Suspect down! Get the officer! Hey, who the hell? Hey, who the hell? Hey, who's fired from this side here? Huh? Who's fired from this side here? Oh, no! He's down! Get the officer! Just, just it, it seemed like everything was in slow motion, um, even though it wasn't. Then we ascend those steps. We're still looking for any more shooters. At that point, we go up to get the injured officer. His hand was still on his gun. Roll him over. He has a gunshot wound to the head. Ran back to my car, grabbed my med bag, ran back up, thinking, you know, instinctively, we're all about you know, trying to triage as much as possible. And I just looked at him, I said, Smallwood, we don't have the time. Because there's no EMS wagon out here. I said, we don't have the time, we gotta go. And the decision was made at that point, we were gonna evacuate him out, put him in a car, and being downtown, we knew we were close to U of L. I'm the third officer in the building. I secured the shooter, uh, his weapon and everything else. So I can visually remember how he was laying, where his weapon was, phone. I can remember every intricate detail of that day. I love Louisville. I'll never move. I love Derby time. It's a great town. It's a great, large, little city is what I call it. Everyone that kind of knows everyone and hasn't changed anything. I, I still, uh, my heart, my heart's in Louisville. I'm Officer Matthew Montano. I've been on for 10 years. My pride and joy, my son Vincent, love him to death. He thinks my car is awesome and, you know, he always wants to get in it and, you know, hit the siren or be on the speaker. He's just the best. You want to be ultra safe and you just want to get home to him at the end of the day and you just want to be there for him. I, th I think about it after the run. I know that um, the true cost of, you know, maybe I can't, I won't go home that day or, or a situation where it could have gone wrong. In the moment, try to take care of business, help anybody that needs to be helped, make everyone safe if, if you can. Has it changed me? I don't, I don't want to say it has, but I think it probably has. It seemed like an eternity. We were at the at the bank when the threat was down. 
We still had to search. And seeing the victims there that you know that you might not be able to help them. Uh, that was the most disheartening thing about it. You know, you see their phones by them or their, their name tags and you, you're, you're asking, hey, do you need help? But hey, you know, tell me where you're hurt at. And you're getting no response. I knew Officer Galloway had, made, had, had gotten shot uh, in, his, in his vest and he was still searching the whole entire building. You have the rest of the, the, um, the civilians in the building and the people that work there and you're trying to say, hey, it's, it's, it's good, it's, it's, everything's okay right now. Um, I know that we tried to get open the bank safe at one time because we knew that they were hiding in there and um, taking shelter in there. Um, I knew she was okay because I could, I was reading the notes in the run, so I knew that they were safe. Um, but it just broke my heart to hear her scream okay. help. 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 Is that the responders? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go ahead and okay. disconnect. I could hear, I could hear people coming down the hallway. Um, I knew it was the cops, you know. Um, you could just kind of hear the shuffle of more than one person. They were getting louder, you know, announcing themselves. And I said, I'm in here and I've been shot. And they took it from there. They took the scarf off and they uh, tourniqueted this leg and then they looked to see if there was any other wounds. got me to that last door to get me out. They had to break it, it was complete glass. And I had to watch it shatter. You know, glass was falling on me as they carried me out. You know, there was, there was cops everywhere. And I could just remember locking eyes with people. I mean, there was just people everywhere. From the time that the cops got me and, and got me out of that building, from that point, it, it definitely seemed like something out of a movie. I don't even know the names of the cops that got me out of there that day or the lady that was in the ambulance with me that you know once I got in there I was I felt safe um, even though I had no idea what was going on but she was she was kind and she was funny and I remember not um, not feeling scared anymore you know like just that light about her you know made me feel a lot better Move that car so we get to see MSL. Who's driving? I will be second. Right, we're going to back you up and get you out that way. Back you up and get you out that way. We're going to back these two up and get them out this way. No, no driver. Hey, you mean drive this? Yeah, you can. All right. Hey, I'm gonna drive this. I'm gonna drive this. Hey, watch my truck, please. Here, here, here. Here, by me. I'm okay. I'm working my way up there. Thank you. Hang in there. Hang in there. You're gonna be fine. I wanted to be a pilot, to be God's honest truth, I wanted to be a pilot and my eyes were so bad, I did not. And then I went to school to be an engineer and quickly realized that that was the worst career path I could have chosen for me. I went into surgery and loved it, uh, became a trauma surgeon and, and I've never looked back. My name is Jason Smith. Uh, I am a trauma surgeon here at the University of Louisville Hospital. I'm also our chief medical officer for UofL Health. It's hard. You know, I think it changes you. I, I'm not the same person I probably was when I started this. I think you, you come into your career a little bit um, innocent and naive sometimes. Um, that gets burned off pretty quick. 
So we hadn't gotten a word of, of what was actually going on other than there had been an officer involved shooting. Then you begin to get more information about how many true victims there are, how many died at the scene, how many are being transported to you. It's the attention. It's the, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening. This is now us. You know, you, you see about it on the news and the realization sets that you're now part of this, you know, this horrible group of cities that have had to deal with this. This is now you. Of course, with all the mass shootings that we've reported on across the country, you always hope that something like this does not impact you and your own community. But here we are on Monday morning, right after Easter Sunday. Room nine is our resuscitation area. So what room nine looks like is there are about five beds in there. Uh, it's an open room. Uh, we have all the things we need to do to care for the patients that come through. So um, things from warm blankets to cover them up, to the IVs, to surgical sets, to ventilators, you name it. The hospital wasn't even, didn't even have time to prepare. So we carried him in and they got room nine, the doors open. We were able to get him on a bed, get, you know, uh, his, his gear off of him. I mean, it looks like organized chaos. They're yelling out things that we have no clue what they're talking about, and every one of them know exactly the step to make. At that point, we knew he was in good hands. Nick? No. I, uh, I wanted a girl. Uh, and everyone told me, oh, no, you don't want a girl. And I was like, well, I just I wanted to be able to buy a prom dress or a wedding dress. It was exciting to have twins. No. It was an adventure. They were due December 25th and, and were born in November. So they were a little early after the twins that, you know, this would be this would be it. And then we had a little surprise, which was awesome. They were so close in age that uh, everybody thought they were triplets when they were little. We did a lot together, a lot about door boy stuff, dirt, you know, woods and mm -hmm. running off making trails or forts somewhere in the woods. That our life and our little tiny cul-de-sac we lived in. My husband is a Gulf War veteran. He's been sick uh, since like our third date. Um, so I've kind of been through it. He was her rock, you know, and, and she has us, yes, but that was her best friend. Mm -hmm. Not to make you sad, but for it to be 30 years this year. We'd been married 30, we knew each other at 32. The two days before he passed, they, Dad took Mom to the doctor to get a test done, and two days later, it's a different story. Nick's incident happened two months and two days after Dad's passing. At Nick's graduation, Dad was going to pin Nick, and that didn't happen because Nick's graduation was on March 31st. Mom had to take over, but you know, that was hard for Nick, too. So he called me and he said to Mom, do you want to do it? Because I was nervous, you know, I just, we've just had so many things happen. I didn't want something else to happen. So I said, I will do it if you want me to. I didn't want to mess up because it was his big day, but uh, he said, you can't mess up. And it was, it was wonderful. He was very excited. Um, he was pumped. Going to Florida and going to the beach was some of the best times that we had together. You do have to look back and do those memories and go on vacations and, and have wonderful holidays together because you just don't know. Yeah, that's what keeps me going. Those memories. Nick? You gotta have the memories. Zach called me uh, and said, uh, Mom, sit down and breathe. And I said, I didn't even bother. I said, what? What? Just tell me. And he said, Nick's been involved. Um, there's an active shooter. And he said, uh, Mom, it's a headshot. And he just took me straight to the hospital and brought me to a little room with a whole lot of people in it. And then when I got there, I knew it was pretty serious when I saw all of the people. They told me the name, but the name didn't sit until I was able to decompress and I realized who it was. That I recruited this kid and did his background last September. I sat in his living room. Yeah. 
Couldn't forget it if I tried. <laughs> so when I met his parents, his mom, brothers, and stuff at the hospital, went to the hospital because they wanted to see us. Um, my initial response was, I'm sorry, because we couldn't get there quick enough. Officer Wilt's uh, mother and grandfather looked me in the face and told us, um, Detective Shaw and I, that um, without your help, Smallwood's help, they wouldn't have had the time that they're having right now. I knew that I was going there to check on my officer and to speak with other family members that had lost their loved ones. That walk through the corridor, understanding and knowing the uncertainty was still there to embrace um, Wilkes family. And for his mother, when I walked in that room to see her, and she looked up at me and she says, Chief, you just swore him in. Those words will forever stick with me. I was helping with one of the patients and I'd, I'd helped operate on actually two of the patients that had come in. And we realized that the, basically the, the mass casualty was over. Um, but we're in the emergency department and we're trying to identify um, who had died at the scene because people were showing up here thinking people may have been transported who were not. It was, you know, that little bit of seeing those, those people, seeing our staff that were crying. A call came in about 8.30 about an active shooter at the old National Bank building. By the time I'm over Slugger Field uh, being separated, um, it's national news. You know, ABC's got it. My mom watches ABC religiously. I mean, she's NBC's got it. They're, uh, you know, officer down in Louisville, Kentucky, mass shooting. Uh, we'll be checking back in with all of our news crews. We also have a crew heading right now to U of L Hospital. They say that there are multiple casualties involved with this. I couldn't get a hold of him. I didn't even know it. Had happened. I, I was um, was actually getting in the shower and a friend of mine called and said something's going on and then I just turned it on. Alerts on our phones telling people to avoid the downtown area because of the situation that's going on but right now we're still kind of in the dark. So the only thing I could do was watch and to hope to like see him. That's just the only way I was able to get like information, any sort, because we didn't know where he was. Jeff and I went downtown to try to find him because we couldn't find him. It was very chaotic. There were just different rumors flying around that where he might be, and um, and we weren't getting information, um, so it was it was hard. Um, and finally, we just stayed at the hospital. They told us to stay at the hospital. It seemed like a week we were there. It was the, it was the longest day. It was like you were paused in a nightmare. We got to the hospital and it was kind of evident he wasn't there. I mean, we didn't have confirmation, just assumed what had happened. It's awful. I'll never forget that morning. So that morning I was already out and about within the city and, and I was on my way um, to go to another meeting. And I looked down and I received that dreadful text message. On April 10th, you saw our heart. You saw who we were. You saw the humanity within ourselves um, that we demonstrated for all to see. Just having something catastrophic happening, you're the gateway for the information of that incident. It's like living in your head because it's all through your ears. I can't see any of it. I can see the computer screen, but I can't see any of what they're saying to me. It's all in my ears. Battalion 20 radio. Battalion 20. Where is the officer? That's what I'm trying to figure out right now. The channels split into two. We received another active shooter at 
the technical college. Um, and in that situation, there were multiple calls again of someone shooting inside the building. We want to uh, let you know, LMPD just tweeted out that there is no active aggressor at JCTC. And then we re had received a third call about a shooting at the Goodwill. We're responding to another shooting, 909 East Broadway at the Goodwill. It was absolute chaos. And they're still managing the situation at the the bank people in the room were like is this real you know is this is this actually happening again on the same day it takes you right back to that to that fear is this happening again is this happening again and your first thought was was it related i heard that come out i got in my car I knew that they might need more cars over there, and so that's that's what I did after I left the bank. Detectives and other resources, people from who don't normally work in that area, are trying to find their you know way to that location. So there were officers absolutely everywhere. This had nothing to do with our active aggressor situation earlier this morning. Uh, two people were shot out in front of the building. One is deceased at this time. The other one has been transported to the hospital. Today is a day that's heartbreaking for our city, for all of us. Let's be clear about what this was. This was an evil act of targeted violence. We lost four children of God today, one of whom was one of my closest friends. Tommy Elliott helped me build my law career, helped me become governor, gave me advice on being a good dad. It's one of the people I talk to most in the world and very rarely were we talking about my job. He was an incredible friend. I was asked earlier today what I'd learned, and it's a hard question right now. I admit that while I'm not angry, I'm empty. And I'm sad. And I just keep thinking that maybe we'll, we'll wake up. I and mean, I know we are all feeling the same, but I also know that they hear us now and that they feel our love. They were just going to work that day, and they're not going home. It's the toughest thing is you couldn't help them. We know we love helping people. I think every police officer does is you love helping people and trying to help them and render aid. And um, knowing that it was a long shot to help them, it was the toughest thing. This has affected not only just me in this department, but it's affected the community and those families of those people who are involved, you know, so I pray for them as well. This is gonna be a situation that we're all gonna deal with for the rest of our lives, so. 
I just hope everybody can receive the comfort and help that they need. Um, I'd only been there six weeks. So, you know, even in the six weeks, I know they're great people. I hadn't even scratched the surface, you know, of getting to know them. They were all really good to me. My kids, their favorite memories, Carolina said. She loved that every time she did something funny, Daddy would laugh at her and then tell her that he loved her. And then James, that I loved how Dad smiled and loved. And I feel like James summed it up so good. He had the best smile and he just loved, just loved. There's no, like, making sense of what happened. And, you know, I've tried to, it doesn't work to make sense. There isn't, it shouldn't, no, it shouldn't have happened. And it's hard the way that he and the others were taken because losing them, losing someone is bad enough, but the way it happened, it's just very difficult to, to separate thinking about him and what happened. And that's what I kind of struggle with right now. That's where I'm at. There's anger. And, and my, my kids too. Um, in particular, my daughter, who's still a little older. She can't understand and she gets mad and she's right for feeling that way. And I feel the same. This year would have been our 11th year of marriage. And yes, we're 11 years in and we have two kids, but I feel like we were just getting started. So I feel robbed and I know my kids do. And I, it's not fair that they don't have their dad. Still trying to figure it out. It's, it's, it's not a day, not a minute goes by that we've missed him. You know, at home, he's not there anymore. And it's just, like he said, it's every second of the day. And it's relentless. Detective Shaw and I, two days after the, the incident, went back to Old National Bank to actually see. Uh, we played Monday morning quarterback ourselves in that reality, looking at the bullet holes and the concrete that was hit, and, you know, that was real. When I was leaning over Officer Will trying to get him uh, out the first time, glass was shattering, but I could see the smoke from the, the glass and the bullet fragments. That kind of sticks with me. The fact that I couldn't get him up on the first time sticks with me to the point where I feel, you know, guilty. Uh, I replay it in my head over and over again. What could I have done better? What we could have done better? What could we have done faster? I go to sleep trying to figure that out when I do sleep. When I go home and actually look at my family, it kind of got to me. We went to my mother-in-law's for Mother's Day and uh, I was there also there Easter. I realized, I said, you know, this chair could be empty and it kind of got to me. And I think that's the first time my kids have ever seen me cry. I would love to say, Natalia, Tuesday I'm gonna be fine. But every Monday, 8.29, 8.30, I'm looking at the clock. And I'm a firm believer, Detective Shaw, Smallwood, and myself, 
We get better as Officer Wilt gets better. He gets better every day, we get better every day. It actually took a U of L doctor who I haven't thanked yet um, that looked me in the face and said, you guys gave him the time we needed to do what we needed to do. And I still didn't really believe the U of L doctor. There was times when he actually coded when they were trying to get him on machines because of his lungs. He was actually starting to progress well with the brain injury. The doctors did an amazing job. I'm sitting there praying going, really? You brought him this far and it's where the lungs are gonna do him in, but they, they found a way as the experts do and there's a lot of experts at this hospital. And um, they found a way and then they brought him back. Look at the teams. I mean, you think about the number of people that had to work to try and get him through this hospital stay, uh, through his complications, and then get him over to rehab, and then begin to see him make some progress, I think is great. I hope one day he's able to, to walk back into the hospital and shake everyone's hands and smile at everyone because that's the most uplifting thing that happens is when patients come back. I was surprised that they were able to save him the day he came in. I mean, that's a testament to our neurosurgeons and what they were able to do. They did a phenomenal job that day. They say tough times bring family together, closer together, and I think that's definitely what happened with us. Mrs. Wilt said to me, before he was uh, really conscious at all, I think he was just, he was able to flutter his eyes and various things like that, but his family said with absolute conviction, they said, we know he's in there. And she knows her son, she was absolutely correct. You want to talk about a good dose of medicine, just to hear him uh, just say hey. <laughs> that would be a good dose of medicine for all of us. He's being an absolute rock star. He's never turned away from a challenge and this isn't stopping him. He's still, every single day I tell him, we're gonna have a good day, right? And he gives me a thumbs up with a nod. Yep, he's like, we're gonna crush it today. He's pretty serious, he's humble, he's quiet, but when he's in the mood, he'll, he'll get everybody laughing. I don't wanna look goofy on camera, Zach. <laughs> okay, how did you miss that charger? Come on, blow! Come on, Nick! Hey! Ah, he gave you a kiss. Good job. I want to take him to the beach. I told him we're going to the beach, you're going to stick your toes in the sand, and I don't care if you're in a chair or whatever, we're putting your feet in the sand. I said I want it because I know that's that was their favorite thing to do. Um, it'll give him just the sun, the air, the sea, just the energy and being with his family. I want to let him know that he's here for a reason. That reason's not over. There's a reason he survived this and everything that came against him. Officer Wilde and Officer Galloway, they're, you know, they're my heroes. I feel humbled and honored to work with them. It just, um, it's something out of Hollywood, what they did. They saved my life that day. And I got to go home and hug my wife and my son, you know, because of what they did. I'm sure Officer Galloway is. I think he's probably a very modest person who is dealing with a lot right now. And if he sees this, I hope he knows he's my hero. And we have this little motto, tell us your very worst and we will send you the very best. We all have a story, who, what, where, when, how. You weigh the pros and cons of what you lost and gained. Um, but for the most part, this job has given me more than I lost. I will say that, but it has changed the way I view life. Um, don't take things for granted. Try to live every day to the fullest. There wasn't anything left unsaid. I know how much he loves us. And I know he knows. Everybody keeps saying, you know, you have a story. I just kind of wanted it to be out there that even though 
something so horrible can happen. Um, there's a lot of good um, to know that there is a lot of good people out there that, you know, you know, have helped me and I'm sure they've helped them, you know, as well through it. Yeah, I want to say thank you to all of them. You know, when people say life is short, it, it really is. People need to keep their eyes on the fact that the majority of people that live in this city are, are good, wonderful people. They're trying to do their best. They want to make a difference. They want to make the city better. They want to make the community better. That helps balance out the bad that we do see, is looking to where we can make a difference and looking to where people are trying to make a difference. Because otherwise you wind up in this, this hole that you can't get out of. You don't see a way out, you get despair, and then you become part of the issue. But I think that's why we have a level of optimism, is that we win more than we lose. When you realize you're part of the solution, then you start to pick your head up every once in a while and look at other people that are part of the solution. And I think that's what makes the difference. Who is here? And our prayers still remain with the families and all the officers and uh, first responders have been affected by this. It's it's very important that we continue to do these types of things, um, and we recognize that this was one event in our city. And unfortunately, these events happen far too often, not only across the country but within our own community. I know as we laid there, it seemed forever. The time just really creeped by, but. In retrospect, when you look back and you see the timeline, uh, by the time um, Officer Galloway and Officer Will got there, it was, it was really fast. And um, even once they got onto the scene and the, um, the officers got into the building and, and announced themselves, it was the response time was amazing. And the staff at UofL. I have um, the utmost respect for that trauma unit. It's something I never would have imagined that they could perform like that under those conditions. And um, top notch, absolutely. About a week before they graduated, uh, Officer Will's class, um, the active shooter happened at the school in Nashville. And we went in the, the classroom and met with them just a couple of days before they graduated, and said to them, you get the opportunity to be those officers that responded to that school in Nashville. Not that you have to. You don't have to go to these things. Like, you can quit at any time. But you get the opportunity to go be somebody else's heroes. 
that's a mindset thing. And little did we know that a week and a half, two weeks later, we were gonna be in the basement auditorium of University Hospital talking to his class and giving them the same talk about how you still drove and put yourself at, at risk in order to protect other people. And that's, that's mindset, that's character. You know, the, the way humans are wired, connection also means safety, right? Like we are, we are interdependent neurobiologically, right? Like we need other people to feel safe. Um, and so to have an event like this, to have a documentary that, that validates and, and supports and builds community is part of how individuals heal. It's also part of how communities heal. And the agency piece, you know, the, the interesting thing about agency is it, it literally can be anything. So when when you are in the throes of, of dealing with trauma, like getting out of bed is agency, taking a shower is agency, you know, fixing a meal is agency. So it can be as basic as that. It's just not not giving in to the feeling that you're completely helpless because trauma can make you feel completely helpless. And so if you do something, anything, it, it breaks that up. I know that um, as time passes, it will get easier. I keep reminding myself of that. Um, the inside pictures out in that hallway, those were five individuals that were amazing people and this world is a sadder place because they're not here. Trauma is, um, it's something you have to face head on, always. Um, some days are easier than others. Sometimes it's, um, the last thing I think about when I go to bed at night, I'll be laying there and I start thinking about that day. And um, I have to actually verbally out loud, tell myself to stop. And um, it's a mindset that you have to get into to uh, push forward. But one day at a time, one day at a time. Twenty-three seconds. A Louisville mass shooting is available to watch anytime at WaveOriginals.com and on the Wave Now app.